Okay, continuing on with the 6.10 lesson, Reuniting a Nation. We were on page 449 and here at Protecting the Rights of African Americans. Despite their differences, both moderate and radical Republicans were deeply disturbed by the defiant actions of the, newly, of the new Southern legislatures, especially the passage of black codes. When Congress convened in April, December 1865, the Republican majority refused to seat, that means officially recognize, the newly elected Southern congressman. Instead, the Republican majority formed a committee to investigate conditions in the South. In committee hearings, one Confederate colonel defiantly said, You have not subdued us. We will try you again. Most alarming, however, was the testimony about the savage repression of former slaves. The committee heard of freedmen being murdered in Texas and being subject, subjected in Alabama to a reign of terror by gangs of ruffians mostly operating at night. Subjected. That's subjected. What did I say? Sub uh, anyway, in response, Republican leaders drafted two pieces of legislation designed to protect the rights of African Americans in the South. The first of these measures was the Freedmen Freedman Bureau Bill. The Freedmen's Bureau was a government agency designed to help designed to help former slaves make the transition to freedom. The agency built schools and hospitals and helped ex-slaves and poor whites find work and shelter. When the Freedmen's Bureau was originally created in March 1865, it was supposed to operate for only a year. But the new bill extended the life of the Bureau. The bill also authorized the Bureau to help resolve disagreements between former slaves and white Southerners to safeguard the rights of blacks and to punish state officials for denying those rights. The second piece of legislation passed by the mostly Republican Congress was the Civil Rights Act of 1866. This federal act sought to cancel out the state's black codes by giving every person born in the United States, with the exceptions of Native Americans, the basic right to own property, make contracts, to sue and be sued, and to give evidence in court. In effect, the Civil Rights Act, by granting certain rights of citizenship, also undermined the Dred Scott decision, which had claimed that African Americans were not citizens. President Johnson claimed that both the Freedmen's Bureau Bill and the Civil Rights Act infringe on states' rights. <coughs> he vetoed both bills. Shocked by the president's vetoes, many moderate Republicans turned against him and allied, allied with the radicals. They secured enough votes in the Senate and House to override Johnson's vetoes and pass both bills into law. On June 1866, Congress went farther, passing the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which declared that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The amendment granted citizenship to African Americans, and it empowered the federal government to defend all citizens from discriminatory actions by state governments. But it stopped short of guaranteeing blacks the rights that radical Republicans and black leaders like Frederick Douglass consider the most fundamental of all, the right to vote. And let's look at this cartoon, this political cartoon that was drawn, um, using his veto power to kick black office holders out of the Freedmen's Bureau. So you can see it's like a dresser, another word for a dresser is a bureau. It says Freedmen on it, and the former slaves being kicked, like showing that he's vetoing the Freedmen Bureau bill. He didn't want uh, that to pass. So that's a, kind of a nice representation of the vetoing of the Freedmen's Bureau bill. Radical Reconstruction. While modern Republicans often considered Thaddeus Stevens too radical on the question of Reconstruction, they respected his commitment to black equality. They were put off, however, by President Johnson's bitter self-righteousness in response to congressional opposition. I have been slandered, I have been maligned, he raged in one speech. Then a governor of Ohio commented, Johnson is obstinate without being firm, combative and The president urged Southerners to resist the Republican Congress. The Southern legislatures, backed by Johnson, refused to ratify the 14th Amendment. Congress responded in March 1867 by passing the first Reconstruction Act, thus marking the beginning of the period that historians call Radical Reconstruction. The first Reconstruction Act divided the former Confederacy into five districts 
with all the ex-Confederate states except Tennessee under military rule. Tennessee, which had, been, which had ratified the 14th Amendment, was brought back into the Union and allowed to retain its state government. Congress declared it would not recognize the remaining southern state governments until they ratified the 14th Amendment and gave black men the right to vote. Johnson fumed the act would bring nothing but anarchy and chaos, and that poor, quiet, unoffending, harmless white population of the South be trodden underfoot. Johnson tried to obstruct the law in any way he could. He appointed military commanders who shared his own views of Reconstruction, and dismissed officials he considered too committed to the Republican program. In response, Congress passed the Tenure of Office Act, which limited the President's ability to fire government officials, including members of the President's Cabinet, whose appointments had been confirmed by the Senate. The act went against the tradition of presidential control of the cabinet. The stage was set for a showdown between the president and Congress. Johnson impeached. In February 1868, Johnson fired Edward Stanton, the Secretary of War and an ally of the radical Republicans. Stanton's dismissal gave congressional... <clears throat> Republicans the excuse they needed to move against Johnson. The House of Representatives voted for the first time in American history, history to impeach a president. According to the Constitution, once a president has been impeached, formally accused of wrongdoing by the House, then the case must be tried by the Senate, where a two-thirds vote is needed to convict. If the president is found guilty of treason, bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors, then the Constitution gives Congress the power to remove him from office. Johnson's supporters argued the president had done no wrong. They argued that the Tenure of Office Act was unconstitutional. They noted that the, Recon the Constitution does not require the president to seek congressional approval to remove an appointed official, and that presidents since George Washington had dismissed cabinet officers at will. They asserted the impeachment was a politically motivated act on the part of the Republicans. Johnson's accusers argued the president had violated constitutional principles and the separation of powers. The president, a charged Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, had transformed his veto power into a weapon of offense against Congress. Johnson said his opponents had tried to put himself above the law. Johnson's Senate trial lasted from March until the May of 1868. On the advice of his lawyers, the president remained silent throughout the whole process, thus acquiring an uncharacteristic air of dignity. His opponents could not prove any of his actions rose to the veil level of a convictable offense. In the end, Johnson was acquitted, not found guilty of the charges, but only by a single vote. Against their party's wishes, <clears throat> seven Republicans voted for acquittal. They argued that if a president could be removed from office for political reasons and without evidence of wrongdoing, then the presidency itself could be controlled by whichever party controlled Congress, thus undermining the Constitution's separation of powers. Johnson survived impeachment partly by backing off his attempts to interfere with congressional reconstruction. With a presidential election only a few months away, he was a lame duck with little real influence. But his narrow victory in the Senate had also worked against his fierce enemies, the radical Republicans. And that, we are stopping now. Okay, that's the end of this lesson's reading. So let's get back to... Right? 451? Yeah, we are at 452, so we're good. Okay, complete the reading guide. You should have had that completed as you went through the lesson. Now we complete the impeachment of Andrew Jackson activity online. We'll find that here. And what did we go to see? Okay, the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. This is a country for white men, and by God, as long as I'm president, it shall be a government for white men. Although Andrew Johnson despised the slaveholding aristocracy of the South and was a fierce opponent of the Confederacy during the war, the former U.S. Senator from Tennessee had never been especially opposed to slavery. He harbored racist attitudes, as evidenced by the quote above. It's probably no surprise then when Johnson encouraged Southern whites to resist the Republicans' Congress. This is attempts to protect the political and civil rights of African Americans in the South during Reconstruction. The stage was set for a clash between the President and Congress. Sequence the following events that started the House of Representatives on its path toward impeaching President Johnson. So wow, how do these all fit together? Okay. The Southern Legislature is backed by Johnson refused to ratify the 14th Amendment. That's first. Second.
Congress passes the first Reconstruction Act dividing the South into five districts under military rule. Cong Johnson vetoes the Reconstruction Act. And lastly, Congress overrides Johnson's veto of the Reconstruction Act. Correct. Phew. Sequence these events that concluded with the House of Representatives vote to impeach President Andrew Johnson. Johnson attempts to obstruct the laws of the Reconstruction Act. Congress passes the Tenure of Office Act. Johnson fires Secretary of War Edward Stanton, an ally of the Radical Republicans, and lastly, then the House of Representatives vote to impeach the Ch President Johnson. Impeachment is a constitutional process by which the House of Representatives accuses high officers of the federal government of misconduct and brings them in front of the Senate for trial. Alexander Hamilton called impeachment a process designed <clears throat> as a method of national inquest into the conduct of public men. The concept of impeachment originated in England. It was adopted by many of the American colonial governments and later by state constitutions. While the delegates to the Constitutional Convention met in Philadelphia, they debated many aspects of impeachment, including which body should act as the court of impeachment and what the definition of impeachable crimes would be. And the end, the framers created an efficient legislative check upon judicial and executive and judicial wrongdoing. Article 2 of the United States Constitution states the President, Vice President, and all other civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treasury, treason, bribery, or other high crimes or misdemeanors. The House of Representatives thus has the sole power of impeaching, and the United States Senate has the sole power to try all impeachments. The removal of impeached officials is automatic upon conviction in the Senate. Impeachment is initiated in the House of Representatives when a member of the House of Representatives presents a list of charges. If it is determined the grounds for impeachment exist, the impeachment resolution or articles for impeachment are reported to the full House. The House debates the resolution and then votes on the resolution as a whole or on an article of impeachment individually. The simple majority is all that is required for each article of the resolution as a whole to be passed. After being impeached by the House, the official must be tried by the Senate. The proceedings now take the form of a trial, where House members present the prosecution. After hearing the charges and the testimony of the witnesses, the Senate deliberates in private. A two-thirds majority is required for conviction. Andrew Johnson's Senate trial lasted a little over two months. The Senate voted 35-19 in favor of conviction. This was one short vote of the two-thirds majority needed to convict and remove Johnson from office. What were the effects of Johnson's impeachment? Select his true statement below. Did he back off his attempts to interfere with Congressional Reconstruction? Yes. And the Radical Republicans lost some of their influence in Congress. Should President Johnson have been impeached? The Tenure of Office Act, which Johnson flouted when he fired Edward Stanton without Senate approval, was considered by many at the time to have violated the constitutional concept of separation of powers. Requiring Senate approval to fire a cabinet-level secretary would have given an advantage and power to the legislative branch. Johnson vetoed the bill because he believed it was unconstitutional invasion of executive power by the legislative branch. So while Johnson's acquittal by the Senate has several negative consequences for Reconstruction, it was positive for the country that it upheld the constitutional principle of separation of powers. The Tenure of Office Act was repealed in the late 1800s and its principles declared unconstitutional in 18, 1926. And that was the end of that activity. Then now the next thing you have to do then is complete the 6.10 checkpoint. I believe you can use your reading guide on this one since, since there was no keyword at the end of the activity. Don't f so make sure you have your reading guide. Yep, you can use your reading guide and complete that checkpoint. So good luck and we'll begin next with the 6.11 lesson.